All right, folks, thanks so much for joining today. Hope everyone can hear me okay. Please let me know if you can't hear me still in the Q&A. Um, welcome to our webinar on the secret to summer course success, uh, transforming learning through annotation. Um, so I'm going to put the link to the slides in the chat. I'll probably share them a couple of times through this session uh, as folks join. Um, but our kind of key, ooh, sorry, we're playing this again, apparently. Um, <laughs> our agenda for today is to just go over a few things. Um, first, we'll start out with what hypothesis social annotation is for those of you who are new to social annotation. So apologies to anyone who... Um, has seen me go through this before. We'll talk about why social annotation can be helpful for your courses um, and go over some kind of quick basics for using hypothesis and how we can leverage using hypothesis in our summer courses to solve some of the challenges that you might face in teaching summer courses. Um, so before we get started, just a quick introduction. If you haven't attended a session with me before, my name is Christy DeCarlis. I'm a customer success manager here at Hypothesis. My background is in instructional design, so I've been doing educational technology support and working with faculty on improving their courses for about 10 years or so. I also adjunct a course and I use Hypothesis in my own teaching. So in some of the things that I'll show today, um, it'll be kind of examples I'll pull from my class and then also from, you know, faculty that I've worked with uh, throughout the years as y'all are always teaching me lots of new and different ways to use Hypothesis. Um, so let us get started. Um, please feel th feel free throughout the session to use the Q and A button um, in the Zoom menu to ask questions or make a comment if you want me to remark on something. Um, and as I said, I'm popping the link to our slides in the chat so you can access the resources I'm going to be sharing today. So I'll first start out with going over what it looks like to annotate with hypothesis, but I want to see um, who, kind of what your experience with, with hypothesis is so far. So if you could take the poll that I just launched, um, this will give me just a sense of the audience today um, and how much detail to go into or to skip um, based on who is in attendance. All right. Thanks so much for taking the poll. Looks like the majority of folks have uh, taken the poll and about 65% um, are brand new to hypothesis. Uh, and then other folks have mostly kind of just used it here and there. So I hope everyone can get some new ideas today. Uh, thanks again for the poll. Um, so I'll start out with what it actually just looks like because um, 40% of you aren't sure what hypothesis social annotation does. So I am going to launch a hypothesis enabled reading from my course site. I'm going to show this in Canvas, but we do have hypothesis available in all of the learning ma management systems. So whether you're using Canvas, Blackboard, Moodle, Brightspace, um, this process looks pretty similar no matter what learning management system you're using. So I'm going to open a reading I've lo I've loaded into my Canvas course site. And in this particular instance, um, I have my reading on the left-hand side, and I've loaded a physics um, open educational uh, chapter into my course. Um, so I have this PDF that my students are opening. And what Hypothesis is letting me do is it is letting me um, add this sidebar to the left-hand side of the text here. Um, and it's being overlaid on top of the reading to give me as the instructor and the students a space to add comments and questions to the reading as they complete the reading. Um, so you'll notice on the left-hand side of the screen, parts of the text are highlighted in yellow. Those parts of the text are associated with annotations on the right hand side. So you can see exactly what word or phrase or sentence a student has annotated. 
um, or me as the instructor has annotated. By hovering over each annotation, um, note that the text that's associated with that annotation on the left uh, changes color when I hover over it. And also the text that is highlighted has been um, quoted in the annotation itself. So it becomes very clear what piece of the text a student is asking a question about or is making a comment on. So in this particular annotation, for instance, Jennifer is annotating this equation that's quoted in the annotation. She's kind of written out the syntax for the equation. And um, if I click this show replies option, uh, I can expand the, um, the replies so that we have not only Jennifer's original annotation, but we can see what other students are responding to her. In this example, Malika is asking a question about the equation. Um, so I can use that information, you know, for my teaching. I can decide maybe I need to spend more time um, on this equation in class based on this conversation that Jennifer and Malika are having. Um, or maybe I see if another student can answer, or maybe I kind of just hop in and provide an answer in the annotation. So I can make some teaching decisions based on the conversations that are happening. But Jennifer and Malika are having this very specific conversation about the course text here. And then if I scroll down, you'll see that they are having a completely separate and distinct conversation a little bit further on about the law of conservation of momentum and what exactly that looks like. So because the students can anchor their conversations to the text, they can respond and react to the text as they read it and have more diverse sets of conversations than we might see in like a traditional discussion board. And I'll go into that a little bit later, um, kind of what the advantages of using hypothesis might be over a more traditional discussion board. Um, so I will get into some of the technical details today, but uh, into like, you know, what kinds of documents you can use in your in your course with hypothesis. Um, but if you have any questions about kind of what we're seeing on the screen here uh, with the annotation functionality, feel free to pop them into that Q&A box so we can address them. If I wanted to add an annotation um, as the instructor or as a student, I would simply select the text that I want to annotate, click the annotate button, and then I can type in my comment and post it before I move on. So again, annotating really becomes a simultaneous activity where students read and reflect at the same time instead of completing their reading as one distinct activity and then doing a discussion board or doing a, you know, a reading reflection assignment or something like that. Um, they can do this reading and react respond right away. So as I mentioned earlier, we work with all of the major learning management systems, Blackboard, Canvas, Brightspace, Moodle are the most common ones. Um, and the way that our integration works makes the technical barrier for entry pretty low for both you and your students. Um, so you don't have to create accounts with Hypothesis um, or go to external websites to access Hypothesis. Um, your students are really just going to be opening the readings from your course site and your learning management system, and they can start annotating right there. So the technical barrier for entry, again, pretty low. And then for you, I know. Um, faculty are often juggling lots of different technology tools. It is not too many clicks to learn how to set it up in your LMS. Um, you would use your, your LMS's own assignment tools to set up your hypothesis enabled readings, um, and you will be able to use your own grade book uh, to grade hypothesis enabled readings as well. We also integrate with things like your group sets. So the default setting with Hypothesis is that everyone in a class can see each other's annotations. So this is the social part of social annotation. Uh, students can see one another's questions and comments and reply to each other. But in some circumstances, that might not be appropriate for everybody in the class to see everybody else's annotations. 
right? If you have a big class, or maybe if you just want students working in, you know, really small groups together um, as they close read a document, you might want to break them up into smaller groups. Another benefit of the hypothesis integration is that you can use the groups that you set up in your LMS course site to create separate annotation spaces for small groups. So why exactly might you want to use hypothesis in your courses? Here at Hypothesis, we like to say that it makes reading more active, visible, and social for your students. Um, the first part, I think, is really key to student comprehension and retention of course materials. Um, so active reading is really going to help with student understanding of the reading. If they're just kind of passively skimming the reading, they're not going to even remember it later on to be able to um, accurately engage with that content. But if we can get them to actively engage with the course reading and maybe even um, get some metacognition going, then that can increase their comprehension and the retention of that course material. So asking students to annotate the text using hypothesis kind of forces them into a metacognitive process. They have to think about things like, what questions do I have? How is this connected to things I've learned before? How is this connected to my own life? You have to think about these things as they annotate so that they can make their annotations. So we're kind of like nudging them into a metacognitive process that will help with their learning. It makes reading visible uh, for us as instructors um, because we can see where students um, are you know, maybe not interpreting something correctly. So sometimes my students comment on a piece of text and they might not, um, you know, they might, you know, comment on it in a way that I'm like, okay, they didn't read this paragraph correctly. So I can re kind of correct course there for them. Um, or if they can, you know, just ask a question about something, then I can see they can't understand it. And then finally, it makes reading social for students because they can see each other's annotations, as I mentioned before, and being able to see their peers' interpretation of the course text helps them better understand the course material and also feel more confident in their interpretations of the course material. And we'll dig into that a little bit more later on. So I see someone ask the question, if I require students to reply to other students' annotations, um, I personally do not require replies. Um, I will, I let my students choose what type of annotation they'd like to make. So I just tell them, you know, they have to annotate. It can be either as a reply to someone else or as an original annotation. Um, and giving them the option I found will lead to conversation. Um, but I have worked with faculty who will stagger their due dates and say, you know, annotate by this date and then reply to a classmate by another date. Um, so there are faculty that will require replies as well. Um, so I see another question that summer classes are often intensive and condensed with longer reading assignments for a given amount of time in classes than the, re the rest of the year. Since annotating and reading take more time than simply reading, how do you break down approximately how much time a reading and hypothesis assignment might take? Um, just so you can give your students a ballpark range of how much time to allow to complete the assignment. That's a good question. I'm going to come back to that because that is something I want to address today when we talk about summer courses. Um, how can we manage the reading load for students and assign our annotated readings appropriately given often condensed time frames? Um, I see another question about what the ideal group size is for annotation activities. Wish I had an answer for that. Um, uh, if I gave an answer, someone might want to punch me through the screen um, because I think it's kind of contentious. Um, so I have my students annotate. I have a, a class of usually between like 20 and 25. All of my students annotate together. But I know a lot of folks that I work with um, say that that's too many people. <laughs> Um, and we'll have students work in groups of five, five to 10. I also work with a faculty member who has 125 students annotating together. So there's lots of things to take into consideration. 
Um, I think how long your documents are and how big your class is can really um, take, uh, you, you know, factor into that decision. Addition, uh, in addition to, um, you know, how frequently students are annotating and uh, what you want them to do with the document. So someone said more than 15 is too many based on student feedback. So I knew someone was going to be like, no, 20 to 25 is too many students. <laughs> Thank you for that. All right, so more reasons why you might want to use social annotation. Um, case study, we have a case study with UT Austin and um, University of Minnesota that using hypothesis keeps students engaged with your course text for longer through the term. So adding hypothesis to your course text can keep that student engagement up um, which can be hard to keep student motivation high in those condensed summer terms, um, especially if they have long readings. A lot of students, I think, sometimes are like, oh, if they see a long reading, I'm just not going to do it. I'm not even going to try. So adding hypothesis can help keep them going to those readings and engaging with those readings. Um, and we have that case study linked in the chat. Hypothesis can also be beneficial because it provides space for all types of students and their comfort level of participating in the class. So if you have a live face-to-face -face class, some students might not want to raise their hands um, in class on the spot, but they can feel comfortable annotating perhaps. So annotation gives them an alternative way to engage. And it gives you a way to anchor your class discussions as well. So I have seen uh, someone shared, we had a conference last week, the week before, I don't even know at this point, <laughs> a couple weeks ago, annotate ed and an English professor shared that whole sometimes just have students comment on a passage and with their name. And that is a passage that they're going to own to talk about in class. So you have something to anchor your class discussions to, and you know which students are going to talk about which passages based on the annotations that they've added. Um, anecdotally, my students have given positive evaluations on using hypothesis, but there has been research that shows students feel that hypothesis does help with their learning, and it feels like that their classmates are working through ideas together with them. I see a question in the chat if I have any insight already on how hypothesis may help with engagement in the age of generative AI. I do. I think that's a good question. So some of the examples of assignments I'm going to go over later on require students to engage with the course text in a way that AI might not be able to engage with it. I feel like I'm going down a prepositional hole there. Um, that's not good. But um, oftentimes, if I take a bit of text from, from a course uh, reading and pop it into AI, it will just give me a summary of the text. Uh, so if I ask my students to do deeper things, like connect it to other course material that we have personally done without giving them a specific material, other readings, um, I can or connect it to their own life experiences, then that kind of forces them to not rely on AI and um, actually engage with the text themselves. Um, so I really like this as a formative assessment alternative to something like the discussion board or um, a, even a written reflection where those questions often get popped into AI and students are just copying and pasting the responses. Um, and we do have something called Hypothesis Academy, which is a whole asynchronous course on um, using hypothesis in response to generative AI. So check that out if you'd like using that link. Uh, so some basics for those of you who are brand new to hypothesis, again, about 40% of you are brand new um, or have never used it. I think that was 60%. Um, I'm not always reliable with remembering the numbers here, but some basic technical getting started info. What exactly can you annotate? Most folks are annotating using PDFs that they've loaded into their course site. Hypothesis at this point works best with resources that are open to students. Um, so things, again, that you can load into your LMS course site. Uh, they might use open textbooks and open educational resources. 
there was a biology professor recently that I talked to who adapted an OER course text for her summer class just so she could use it with hypothesis. <laughs> so it can be a really powerful way to get students engaged. Any web pages and online articles that are not paywalled, you can have students annotate. Um, YouTube video transcripts are now an option. So even beyond a traditional document, if there is a YouTube video that you'd like students to watch and engage with, you can pop the URL in and have them annotate that video. And then the exceptions we have to kind of that free and open rule are JSTOR and Vital Source. So if you'd like students to um, read a JSTOR article through the library, you can use the JSTOR URL to have students annotate that without even having to log into your university's library. It'll automatically sign them into that. Um, additionally, if you're a Vital Source independent school, you can have students annotate vital source e-texts using hypothesis. And then on the other hand, what can you and students put in annotations themselves? So um, a lot of folks really tend to lean into annotating with text. Don't think that's necessarily a problem, but there's a lot of power in what else we can annotate with. So we can really add multimodality to our course text with these other options, like images and video. You can embed images, you can embed a video into annotations. Um, so again, one of the faculty that was presenting at our conference a couple of weeks ago mentioned that if she has an article that students are reading that are a good article, but perhaps slightly outdated, um, she'll kind of, you know, add an annotation around statistics and embed an image with um, annotate and embed an image with updated statistics for that article. So that's a great way to kind of keep the reading still fresh and your students knowledgeable about what's going on. Um, in the same vein, kind of students can also add things that help them understand the course concepts. So um, sometimes my students will embed video or add um, the links to external websites in order to say like, hey, this helped me better understand this concept. So students can add external URLs, they can add tags, emoji, or use LaTeX to add equations to annotations. If you'd like to learn more about how to use Hypothesis in your learning management system, we have a getting started page for each of the major learning management systems um, because I'm not gonna go through a demo of how to actually set that up today. So again, the link to the slides is in the chat if you wanna check out our LMS getting started pages. Um, someone asked in the chat, is there a way to highlight when you as an instructor add a video or similar as an annotation so students won't miss it? Um, there's no way to kind of like pin an annotation at this point, but that's been coming up kind of frequently lately um, or, you know, like highlights in that way. <laughs> um, so I will definitely pass that back to our product team. That's a great idea. So. Some people have brought this up already, but when we are thinking about using social annotation in our courses, um, sometimes we are presented with some common challenges. So I want to see what your challenges are that you would want to grapple with. So if you could answer the poll again, um, what challenges do you face in teaching summer courses? Like what is your biggest concern in trying to you know, use social annotation um, in a summer course? Because I know not every school, especially like our quarter system schools, does have condensed summer term schedules. But I know um, other schools, it's like you have, you're teaching a, a full course in like 25 percent of the time. So I, I know there's a lot of variance there. All right. So it looks like about half of you are concerned about the condensed summer schedules and then another half are concerned about keeping students engaged, which I know can be difficult. Um, if I'm in New Jersey, so like students are going to the beach, they're not thinking about, <laughs> I realize that not everybody can just like go to the beach whenever, but in New Jersey, that is the concern. People will just like go off to the beach and not be worrying about their classes. Um, so how can we keep our students engaged? Um, that'll be one thing we'll talk about. Thanks again for the, the poll answer. 
Um, so one thing we mentioned here are condensed terms. How can we engage and assess students similarly to a traditional length course without overloading students in a way that is not manageable or sustainable for the students or for you as the faculty? Distracted students, like I mentioned, maybe your students are going to the beach or concerts, or maybe they are taking this condensed summer course while they're trying to work full time, or maybe they're taking like three condensed summer courses, even though all of their advisors told them they shouldn't do that. Um, how can we make sure that students are engaged when they have lots of things going on and make sure that they don't get burned out? And then assessment management. I know teaching summer courses for faculty is challenging as well. So how can we design summer classes with a manageable teaching load for you on the instructor's end? So I'm hoping that we can kind of go through each of these challenges together and talk about how Hypothesis might help solve them. I do see the question in the chat about Hypothesis and accessibility. Um, we are an accessible tool. You can find out more about the accessibility um, at the website that I'm going to put in the response here. Um, so we can be used with a screen reader. Uh, most importantly is what comes up uh, very frequently. So, and we should have an updated VPAC coming quite soon if you're interested in that, but you can learn more at the linked website. So annotation solutions, um, I think I had a poll for this. Let's see. What your, what your, I'd like to figure out what your potential goals might be. And then we'll, we'll merge those kind of with your summer course challenges to come up with some solutions here. Um, so what do you struggle with most when it comes to the students reading? What do you kind of want to figure out more from that? If you could answer that new poll. Again, I kind of want to like take these ideas and like massage them together and see how good of a job I can do on the fly with that. We'll see. It's an experiment. Okay, so looks like I'm going to notice people are still answering. I have to read a lot for this one. It's interesting. I gave the same poll at our conference um, a couple weeks ago, and the answers were like completely different. <laughs> it's always interesting to me. All right. So I'm going to share the results so you can see. Um, so 40% of you are saying knowing whether or not they did the reading, that's important. Getting students to actively discuss the reading in class, 55% of you say that's important. So those are kind of our two key things with a pretty even split amongst the other stuff. So getting students to discuss the reading actively in class was really important at the conference a couple of weeks ago, but knowing whether or not they did the reading was not as, didn't really show up on the radar, which is interesting. Um, so we'll kind of tie those goals in as we talk about some of these strategies. So thanks for letting me know that. So how can hypothesis social annotation help address the challenges we talked about? Condensed schedules, keeping students engaged, and um, you know, keeping a manageable teaching load. Um, all, adding a new type of assignment into a course can feel a little bit overwhelming when you have to keep all these things in mind. So I want you to think about these three things in approaching your summer course design. So first, what are your biggest course sticking points? What do your students struggle with the absolute most in your summer course? Then I want you to think about what um, engagement frequency makes sense given how condensed is your term, okay? So I have worked with summer classes that are four weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, um, there's different meanings of condensed to different people. So determining how frequently it is kind of sustainable to ask them to stay engaged will be important to think about. And then how can we encourage them to not only engage with the course text, but build community and co-create knowledge together, because that will increase their likelihood of retention and success and engagement kind of throughout the course. And we'll look at that at the very kind of end of things. 
So I'm hoping through identifying your core sticking points, determining your frequency, and trying to figure out a way to build a community, we can solve those problems of trying to keep students engaged with the course text in these condensed summer courses in a manageable way. So first one, identifying your course sticking points. I do not think it is reasonable in a summer course to have your students annotate every single reading. Um, I think that can be particularly difficult if students are doing long readings um, or if they have multiple readings in you know one week to get through. So what I would encourage you to do is really go through and try and think about where do the students um, struggle with the most? Like, are there certain readings that present the uh, largest challenges to students or that students are most hesitant to engage with? Maybe they aren't the most challenging readings, but maybe the students like don't want to talk about them. That could be a that could be a sticking point for you. Um, so identifying the sticking points could help narrow down where you want to really have students annotate. You could even consider chopping like part of a reading up, chunking a reading into smaller parts um, and having them annotate like the most challenging parts if you're worried about the assignments becoming overwhelming to students. How are some different ways we can approach these readings once we've decided what to use? Um, Pre-annotating the text could help students um, go through those long readings. So instructors in higher education especially, you all have been trained. You know how to read through long texts, right? You know how to parse text and look for important things. Um, annotation is often seen as doing close reading, but you as the instructor can also provide guidance on how to hone in on the most important aspects of the reading as well, and perhaps give notes on where the student can afford to skim if they need to. So those are things that perhaps our, our skills are, our students haven't learned yet. Um, and you can go in and add your own annotations to the text before students have access to maybe make a note of how you would approach doing this 70 page reading for like, you know, one day of class or whatever, um, maybe more than that. I don't know what what you all are doing out there, but uh, you can give them hints and provide that guidance or give them some guiding questions through those seated annotations. And these little pencil icons, when you have access to the slides, will take you to some sample assignments that you can use in your class. So this particular one is about reading academic articles with students. Um, if you want to guide your students through that, um, you could, you know, use some of the points here. Someone mentioned in the chat, I plan to start using social annotation for understanding the course syllabus. That is my favorite way to get started. So we're going to talk about that soon. And someone else mentioned, if you're just introducing hypothesis to your students at the beginning of class, would you recommend giving them more of a softball-like assignment to start out? Yes. And that's why my the syllabus is my favorite assignment to start with. It's kind of like that softball assignment. So we're going to talk about that. And I will give you um, a video you can include in your first assignment to also just kind of smooth out any potential issues that the students might have. Because I know in a summer class, you don't have any time to like you know, correct technological issues. Um, if you do go in to add your own annotations to a course text before students have access to it, uh, you can copy those annotations from semester to semester. So all that work that you put in for the summer course, you could use it, you know, in a traditional term, or you could use it in the summer in the future, um, because now we have a export and import capability in our annotations. So I've linked that in the slides. I won't kind of get into it now, but I just want to give you the heads up that if you do add those annotations for your students, you can reuse them pretty easily in future terms. Um, hypothesis can also be really great in jargon heavy courses. Again, we're kind of in the identifying our course sticking points um, bucket right now, right? So do you have a 
a reading that is particularly jargon heavy or that has a lot of notation and syntax that students aren't familiar with. Uh, this might be something to hone in on with hypothesis and ask students to clarify that notation and syntax or ask questions um, or even take those technical passages and act like they're explaining them to like a younger student or something like that to assess their comprehension. Um, so that could be another way to kind of narrow down the readings in which you would like to use hypothesis. Again, there's a little uh, assignment linked on this slide as well as an example. So that is one way to kind of decide how we're going to use hypothesis in our courses. What are the stickiest points? What are the students struggling most with or most resistant to reading? The next consideration that you'll want to make is how frequently do you want students to engage with your course materials, whether that's a course text or something else? Um, what is reasonable for a condensed summer course? And how do we make sure that that engagement is high quality? Those are kind of some key challenges there. So I think we want to make sure, especially with a summer course, right? You're diving in. We want to make sure the students know right away how to annotate in a high quality way. We don't have any time for people to be like, yeah, agree with the author on this point. Great job, off to the beach. Um, so how can we really encourage students to get into those high quality annotations immediately? You, I think when you provide your instructions for students to annotate, providing them with some examples and non-examples of what a high quality annotation looks like and does not look like is really beneficial. Um, I think students can really run with those examples. That first assignment, dedicating a little bit more time to providing feedback for students that are not meeting expectations can really help them course correct for the rest of the term. And then quickly kind of make grading a little bit quicker for you later on. And then another thing that came out of our conference um, from one of our faculty presenters, Katie Pierce, she highlights exemplary student posts um, from each annotation assignment. So after the first annotation assignment, if there is an annotation that really like shows what the students are doing, it can be like your hypothesis highlight of the week of the unit of whatever the you know module term you want to use in your summer courses to show students that is what you want the annotations to look like. Um, so here is an example of an example and a non-example from my own annotation instructions. So I tell students, um, this is what I expect versus what a not as great annotation looks like. So in my non-example, you can see that um, the student is just saying, oh, this reminds me of this, but they don't explain why. And I want them to go deeper and make that connection. So I make sure in my example to um, make sure that I explain that. If you need a softball assignment for students to annotate before they really annotate, to, you know, like get them used to the tool, have them annotate the annotation instructions with these examples and non-examples and ob make observations. That's another idea, just having them annotate annotation instructions. Really getting meta there <laughs> with the, with the uh, assignment, but that could be a way to get students to try out annotations um, and engage with the examples and non-examples you've provided to them. Back to my favorite starting assignment otherwise. Um, thanks to whomever included that uh, suggestion in the Q&A. Starting by annotating the syllabus can really answer a lot of questions quickly um, at the beginning of a condensed summer term. So having students annotate the syllabus can help diagnose any issues they might have with the tech, gives a space for questions and answers that they can go back to. And you can share the video that is linked on the slide with your students that will show them how to annotate if you're worried about them being able to take on a new technical to tool to do so. Um, generally, I found that students don't have a lot of issues annotating, but that video is really helpful to include. And again, the little pencil icon does link to sample syllabus um, annotation instructions. Um, if you're concerned about engagement frequency in your course, consider just like completely just getting rid of your discussion boards. Like, I don't know if that's an assignment you have, but 
Um, how can you use annotation to supplement a different type of assignment or replace a different type of assignment? If you're doing something like a discussion board or a reading reflection, annotation might actually get more for you than those other assignments because students do have to engage with it in a more authentic way, whereas I think discussion boards and reading reflections oftentimes are more susceptible to like students just popping those questions into an AI tool. Um, students also seem to respond a little bit more positively to tools like social annotation and, and hypothesis over something like a discussion board. Um, discussion boards kind of have a bad rap as like busy work at this point. Um, and then you can use that engagement to ident better identify your teaching opportunities. Um, so I mentioned before uh, that, you know, oftentimes instructors will use what they see happening in the annotations to then decide what to talk about in class or use the annotations to drive that class discussion. Doing that in conjunction with like highlighting exemplary student annotations, those are great ways to maintain motivation because students see that they're annotating and they're reading for a reason. You're going to talk about their annotations. You're going to highlight people who are doing a great job. That motivates them to keep engaging with that course material. So I have linked to this slide our kind of most general annotation assignment instructions. Um, these are very similar to what I use in my own course and how I prompt my students to engage with the text. I try to prompt them in a way that um, leaves the text open for a diversity of comments, but also gives them an idea on how to engage meaningfully with the text, because sometimes students aren't sure of how to do that. So if you're a little worried about overloading your students with assignments and yourself with grading, Consider, can social annotation replace something else in a course? Reading quiz, um, discussion board, reading reflection, something like that. You can offer students a, um, a way to be creative in uh, annotating the text to try and maintain student motivation as well. Um, so I know some faculty have asked students to create memes related to the readings or use emoji in their annotation. So depending on what your goals for annotation are, might not be appropriate for some of the things that some folks are reading, but it could be appropriate for others. So I would think about all these things in conjunction with each other when trying to decide how frequently I want my students to annotate. Um, you know, what kinds of readings are they annotating? Are they doing it more creatively or kind of more seriously and academically? Am I replacing other assignments with the annotation assignment that so that they can spend more time annotating? Um, I will kind of keep all these things in mind when deciding how often to have students annotate. And then finally, building a community and knowledge co-creation are really important in student retention and success as well. So how can we make sure that we do that with social annotation? Um, I think the way you prompt social annotation can really uh, affect how students respond to the text and whether or not they feel invited to use their own knowledge to um, contribute to the conversation. So for example, in the, these instructions that I linked to before, um, I tell my students to find an idea or passage in the text that is connected to something they already know um, or what's based in their own life experiences. So my course is, um, I teach a gender studies course and um, it's about gender technology. I have mostly non-majors in my course. So my students bring a lot of knowledge that I don't have to the course. Um, so my students, for instance, um, we might be reading something about AI facial recognition technology, and someone who is a criminal justice major might chime in with how it's used in policing and what the impacts are. So can the students actually bring knowledge to the text? Um, I worked with a bio professor who also had students, largely a non-major course, where she had her students, every reading they had to find like an article, a news article, or like a, a, a scientific paper, that was linking their major to the topic they were reading about. Um, so that is 
an interesting way to kind of keep things relevant for students as well. Um, I'm linking this in the chat for the question. I see the question about annotating video. So we, if we have some a minute at the end, I can show you how that looks too. I think it's also important to make sure that we introduce to students the uh, a way to engage with their classmates that is facilitating a discussion. So the tag feedback protocol is something I really like. I did not invent this. The slide notes have a link to the source, um, but this is a way that you can have students engage with their classmates um, in something that's better than like great point. Um, so asking them to tell something they like about a response, ask a question about a response, or give suggestions, giving students out a guideline like this can help them um, engage with the annotations in that way. And then finally, I think if you are concerned about adding a reading time to the course readings itself, um, there are other ways to use annotation to um, make more informed and fast decisions in your uh, condensed summer course than just with the course readings. So you can have students annotate ancillary course documents, like a study guide, or like project instructions, or um, the PDF of your lecture notes. They can annotate any of those things um, in order to um, ask questions and give you information about how to spend that class time. So I have my students annotate project instructions, again, because I find this to be a really great way to collect questions, not use class time for that, you know, question and answer session for the, um, for the project. Uh, and it's an alternative to annotating course readings if that seems to be um, like it's gonna add too much to their plate. Um, so I'm going to put out one more or no, I'm going to have, I have two more polls, but let's do, let's do this one. Um, what idea can you see using in your own class based on some things that we've gone through today? And I do want to go back to one of the original questions about um, asking how much longer you might add to a reading to have students annotate that. Um, I think that is something that is going to be like highly individual to the course and and um, how you'd like to, the students to annotate the course text. Um, one thing you do get with Hypothesis is um, access to me as an instructional designer. So if you want to brainstorm that out with me, um, you can always reach out to us. Um, but that is something that I think would be very specific to an individual course. Looks like lots of people want to annotate the syllabus and um, guide their students through course readings. That sounds pretty great to me. Awesome. Um, so some results, I, I've been talking about... Um, Lots of different ways we can use social annotation, but what can we hope to get out of social annotation? Um, social annotation can really help with student self-efficacy. So this study from about 10 years ago compared a traditional discussion board to anchored annotation. So anchored annotation, just to clarify, is annotation that is connected to a specific piece of text. So like we see here where the text is quoted, like this annotation is linked to a specific piece of text. I can see exactly what they're annotating. So when we compare that to a traditional discussion board, anchored annotation increased student confidence, their motivation to help others, and their, in, their sense of influence on course conversation. So all of these things help students stay motivated in their courses, their, their retention, um, and their confidence to keep going. We have kind of um, seen similar results with uh, an undergrad pharmacy professor who has been using hypothesis in his courses. Um, so this is more recently, I think within the last two years, 
he compared using hypothesis in his undergrad pharmacy courses to the students that were not using hypothesis. And the students that were using hypothesis were more likely to see themselves as scientists, and they were more likely to comprehend the text at a graduate level. So it was improving not only their comprehension of the course text, but their likelihood in moving on in STEM fields. And the gains were equitable across student demographics, including um, first-generation communities and um, people of color. So that was uh, really promising results in increasing student self-efficacy. And this is why I think Providing those not, uh, those opportunities for knowledge co-creation and building community can be really important in achieving those results. Um, I think a lot of this also ties back to UDL or Universal Design for Learning, which is um, just a framework that helps us reach all types of learners in our courses. Oftentimes, students drop out of courses because perhaps they aren't the best readers or the best writers, and that's often how we're being assessed in college. But multimedia options in Hypothesis uh, give you options for what you can annotate and how you can annotate it. So students aren't really limited to just the text option. Um, and it provides better clarification for students who are trying to get through that text, even if it's not their strength. I see a couple of related questions to this in the chat. Is it possible to annotate portions of images? Right now, it is not possible to annotate images um, because the text has to have a text layer in order for a hypothesis to be able to select something on it. But that is on our roadmap for the future. So that will be a future feature to annotate images. And then this slide has all of the starter assignments that I linked earlier on. So if you want to see any of the sample assignments and use the prompts in your class, you can use those there. All right, so I have just a few slides left. I am going to put a final poll out there, and then I'm also going to um, show how it looks like to annotate video because someone asked about that. So I'm going to launch this poll if you could let me know if you need further assistance um, with hypothesis that would be great and i'm going to open a video annotation just to show what that looks like so with our video annotation tool um, basically what happens is a youtube video gets loaded with a transcript alongside of the youtube video um, and the students and you as the instructor can annotate the transcript as you would any other text. So this transcript is going to follow along with the narration of the video. Um, and this, the white box will kind of follow along with the narration. And you can select the text in the transcript um, in order to annotate it. So that's what that looks like. Um, very similar to annotating a traditional document. We just have the video playing alongside that. All right, so our last few slides as we wrap up today, uh, just give you an idea for those of you um, who have access to hypothesis at your school, um, what you have access to. Um, so your hypothesis partnership gives you access to pedagogical support. Um, so you can always schedule some time with me to talk about how you can best implement this in your course, um, given your specific course circumstances. We also do custom webinars for schools. So if we, if you'd like me to present for just your faculty, we can arrange that. Um, and our support team email is on this slide. Hypothesis Academy is also something that um, Hypothesis subscription institutions have access to. Uh, so these are asynchronous training courses, and by the end of the course, you can learn how to um, create an assignment in your learning management system, but also develop assignment instructions for your class. So we have two topics, Social Annotation 101 and Social Annotation in the Age of AI. Again, asynchronous training opportunities, you can register on that slide if you are interested in learning that way or using the link in the chat. Um, partner schools also have access to our partner workshops. 
This summer, we're actually featuring two series, uh, workshop series. One is on just getting kickstarted with social annotation, which covers all the basics. And then the other is about um, a series on social equity and social annotation. So you can find out more uh, using the link in the chat and register for those workshops. Uh, finally, for those of you who are not Typothesis partners, um, we are running a Kickstart promotion right now, which is designed to help new users. And we just put a link in the chat um, to the Kickstart promotion. Um, and you can also schedule a time with one of our representatives to learn more about how you can get Hypothesis at your institution if you don't currently have access to it for summer. So you can use the link to meet with our team member um, from that most recent chat message. And finally, you can reach out to me if you have any questions, you need assistance getting started, please reach out to the success email, um, whether that is how to get it set up in your learning management system, um, you know, more pedagogical, like abstract, you know, how should I implement this in my course or something else completely. Um, but I really thank you for your time today and for joining us to talk about summer courses. Um, let me know if you have any final questions because we have two or minutes or so left in the q and a. Is there anything else I can answer for you in the last couple minutes? Um, as someone mentioned pricing. You would have to schedule time with the uh, link. If you use that link in the chat for the meeting schedule, uh, Sonia can help you with pricing. That is unfortunately not my um, my domain. <laughs> I really, I'm, I do not handle pricing. So please do schedule some time with Sonia. Thanks again, everyone for joining. I really appreciate uh, your time today and looking forward to working with you all in the future. Have a great day, everyone.